weekend of the new year is we win in 2010 our year of release. Everybody say release. Listen to me. Things that have been held back, everything that's been held back is about to be released. There's going to be a release of finances, a release of wisdom, a release of God's favor coming upon us like you haven't ever seen before, a release of harvest that we've not seen or experienced in the past. There's going to be a, a release of dreams and, and visions. I'm telling you, get ready for some of the greatest victories we've ever experienced. We're going to see this generation arise and shine. We're going to see prodigals come home. We're going to see breakthroughs and turnarounds, things that we believe for and stood for a long time. This is going to be a year of release. Hear the word of the Lord. We win in 2010. I'm telling you, get ready to see the glory of God. The glory of God is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We're going to see incredible miracles. We're going to see the demonstration of the power of God like we've not seen before. I'm telling you, this is going to be a year of release. We win in 2010. The power of God is going to be released into our lives and into our services and into this earth like we've not ever seen before. I believe we're going to see some of the most incredible opportunities and doors of opportunity that open for the gospel like we've never seen before. It's going to be an incredible year. Everybody say release. It's going to be a year of release. Tremendous victories that are going to come our way. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. Everybody say always. So that doesn't mean we've never experienced victory. It doesn't mean there hasn't been release or breakthroughs because God is faithful. He always causes us to triumph. But I believe this year, for those who are ready, turn to the person next to you and ask him, are you ready? I believe this is going to be an incredible year, an extraordinary year of God's favor being poured out upon those who are ready, upon the church, those that are looking. Incredible, extraordinary favor. Everybody say favor. God's favor. Proverbs 3, 4 says, you will find favor with God and with man if you're focused upon God's mercy and God's truth. How many of you are focused upon God's mercy and God's truth? Well, then you're going to find favor with God and with man. I want to encourage you to be looking for God's favor. Favor like you've never experienced before. This is going to be a year of release. Everything that's been held back, I'm telling you, get ready. It's going to be released in this year. Things that you've been believing for, things that look like it was all over, things that you may have been giving up on, I'm telling you, it's going to be released in this year because of the favor of God. If you're ready, if you're looking for it, if you'll release your faith. And today, I, I want to talk about how you can win. We're, to, we're destined to win in 2010. But there's some things we've got to do to be in position to win. There's got to be some things we've got to do in order to be there and receive the release that God has for us. You see, 2009 has been a setup year. 2009 has been a year of positioning, of preparation. Makes no difference what kind of year you've had in 2009 or what your life has been like up to this point. 2009 was a setup year. You may have experienced some setbacks and disappointments. You may have even felt like you've experienced defeat in 2009. I'm telling you, get ready. Get ready. You, you, you may have had a, a year where you've had great breakthroughs. You, you've had increase in your life. I'm telling you, 
it's just a setup for what's about to happen. So no matter where you've been or what's happening in your life, it's all been a setup for what's about to happen in 2010. And I'm wanting to stir you up in your faith to lift up your eyes and begin to believe God and that we would go on the offensive and we would begin to take back the things that the devil has stolen. Listen, this is our hour. This is our time. The glory of God is going to cover this earth. But we've got to be ready. 2009. It's been a setup year, all in preparation for what God wants to do this, this year in 2010. T.D. Jakes, Bishop Jakes was here two weeks ago tonight, uh, Sunday night, December 20th. He had a great word for us. I don't know how many of you were here. Well, we were, how many of you were here the night of Bishop Jakes? Not that many of you, maybe 25% of you, we were filled to the rafters. We had overflow in the activity center and the chapels. And, and uh, Bishop Jakes, uh, he's a preaching machine. He had a, a great word about being planted and staying planted in the house of the Lord. Those that are planted will flourish. How many of you are planted? <laughs> I, I'm encouraging you, get planted, get rooted, get your feet upon the, the rock and get planted. Those are the ones that flourish. But in the midst of, of bringing that message he gave what I believe was a prophetic word about 2009 being a year of positioning for 2010 and 2010 being a year of great release. I want you to hear what Bishop Jake said two weeks ago. But I was teaching about a bow and arrow and suddenly God made me understand recessions come before progression. That when you take a bow and you put it in an arrow, the goal is for it to go forward, but the strength is in pulling it back. And the further you pull it back, I mean, when the tension is so tight that it feels like the string is about to break in the bow, and the bow is screaming because it's being pulled to its utmost limitation. When you really pull it back like that and then release it, the further it went back, that's how much further it's gonna go forward. 2009, we got pulled back. But baby, in 2010, I believe we're gonna get a release. Do you hear what I said? I believe we're gonna get a release like we have never seen before. And to all of you that's been stretched this year and pulled this year and tugged this year and everything in you feels like it's about to snap, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Yay, hallelujah. Are you ready? Would you just stand up with me? I'm telling you, just, just bear with me. I want you to act this out with me. I want you to get your bow out. Come on, get your bow out here. And uh, get your hand on the string. I'm t are you ready? You ready for the release? How much release do you want? <laughs> What's 2009 been like? Has it been a set up year? All right, just begin to pull that bow back. Come on. Pull it back. Come on. Come on, ladies. A little further. Come on, guys. Come on, back. Back, back to your ear. Come on. Pull it back further. Pull it. Don't let go of it. You feel the tension? The further you want the arrow to go, the further you got to pull it back. Come on. Back. Everybody on the count of three. One, two, three. Release. Yeah, shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody say release. Everybody say it's my year of release. All right, you can take your seats. Luke chapter 4. I'm telling you, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. God is ready to release all that he's promised. I'm telling you, God is ready to release all that he has promised. All we've got to do is get ready in order to cooperate with God to allow everything that God's promised to come into our hands. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. This is where Jesus had come out of the wilderness. He's ready to step into his ministry. He'd been led out into the wilderness by the... Spirit of God, and we, he was tempted by the devil three different times. And he overcame that temptation 
by the word of God. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written that you should serve the Lord your God and him only. It's written that you should not tempt the Lord thy God. And overcame that temptation. He came out of the wilderness and he came into the synagogue. Here in verse 16, Luke chapter 4. And so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And his custom, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel. That's the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of of the Lord. Then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus just declared release into the earth. He said, I'm releasing healing. I'm releasing provision. I've got good news for the poor. You don't have to be poor anymore. I'm releasing wholeness into the people. Deliverance to break off the chains of bondage. To heal the brokenhearted. To lift off the burden of, the press, of those that are oppressed. And I'm declaring to you the acceptable year of the Lord. Everybody say the acceptable year. The acceptable year of the Lord is the year of release. In the Old Testament, every seven years was the year of release. Turn over to Deuteronomy 31 just real quick. I want you to see this. We're talking about release. Everybody say release. Get ready, get ready. Deuteronomy 31. The release is going to begin here today for those that are ready. Those who are prepared. Those who will release their faith. Look at Deuteronomy 31, verse 9. This is where Moses is ready to turn over leadership to Joshua. He's been leading the people. He's been giving the people the word of the Lord, giving them the law of the word. And in verse 9 he says, So Moses wrote the law and delivered it to the priest, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, at the appointed time, in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, every seven years was the year of release, the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus stands up in the synagogue, and he says, today, I'm fulfilling this scripture, and he's declaring, I am the release. And from that moment forward, all who would believe in Jesus, he's saying the release is available. And this is a year for us to tap into the release that God has for healing, prosperity, finances, good news to you that are poor, good news to you that are oppressed, good news to you that are sick, good news to you that are oppressed and, and bound up, good news to you that are moving forward in whatever God's calling you to do because it's the year of release. God's going to release everything he's promised into your life. Wisdom beyond anything you could imagine. You're going to know things that you didn't know. You're going to know how to do creative ideas coming your way. Favor, extraordinary favor coming upon your life. I'm telling you, this is the year of release. We win in 2010. Amen? Amen. Everybody shout to God, we win. Amen. Now, I want to share with you what I believe are three major areas of release that we're going to experience this year. I think there's release in many different aspects and many different ways that's available to every person. You that are watching, whatever you need release in, it's available. If you'll just hear the word of the Lord and you believe and release your faith for it. But I believe there's three major areas that God is going to do something extraordinary in in the area of release. Turn over to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. The first area of release that I believe we're going to see some, something beyond what we've seen in the past, an extraordinary area of release is in the area of what's been stolen and lost. Jesus in John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, 
and destroy the devil. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking those whom he can devour. And where he's been able to get into people's lives, no matter what the reason, no matter if it's been your mistakes or mistakes of others, or it's really immaterial what's created the problem. If you hear what God is saying here tonight, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And there are those who are listening, those out here, the devil has stolen from your life. Families, finances, dreams and visions, you've been robbed by the enemy. And this is a year of release, of getting back what the devil has stolen. Joel chapter 2, verse 25. Joel prophesied this. He said, so I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, the chewing locusts, all that has been destroyed, all that's been lost, I'm going to restore it to you. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, get ready. Turn to the person on the other side. Restoration's coming your way. One of the areas that we're going to see great release in is getting back what the devil has stolen. You that are sitting out there that have dreams and visions that you've thought were, were not going to come to pass, you've given up on them, I'm telling you, it's time to rekindle those dreams and visions. Things that have been lost, relationships, children, businesses, jobs, finances, get ready. God's going to restore those things. There's going to be a release of those things to come back. Restoration. We see a great story in 1 Samuel chapter 30 that gives us insight to what we have to do in order to receive the release. God is ready to release it. He is the acceptable year of the Lord. He is ready to release and bring back everything that's been stolen. Proverbs 31 says, Proverbs 6:31 says, when the thief has been identified, he has to pay it back sevenfold. So I, I'm not talking about just getting back what's lost, but I'm talking about getting it back sevenfold. Amen. Now, here's the thing about getting back what's stolen. It, it does not usually come back in exactly the same fashion or the same thing that was lost. But it always comes back with greater value and increase. So you've got to be looking for In other words, if you lost a job... God's going to restore that job, but it may not be the exact job that you have. But I'm telling you, promotion is coming your way. He's going to release new job, favor coming your way. There may have been things that you've lost, but God's going to restore it in, in another way. You've got to be looking for it. You've got to be expecting it. Because if you don't, you'll miss it. There are miracles coming your way, but you've got to be ready for them. Jesus, when Jesus came the first time, people were believing for the Messiah. They were looking for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But the Bible says most of them miss their day of visitation. And at the end of this year, we're, this is the first weekend of 2010, and I'm declaring to you it's a year of really, release that we win in 2010. And it can come to the end of the year, and you can look back and say, where's that release? <laughs> we didn't win, we lost. Only if you're not opening up your eyes and looking for the way God wants to bring it your way. 1 Samuel chapter 30, David had lost everything. Talking about King David, a man after God's heart. And we see in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, David coming back to Ziglag. And when he returns to Ziglag, where his family was and where he had set up camp, when he got back there, everything was gone. His children were gone. His wife was gone. All of his men's family were gone. Everything was lost. He was experiencing devastation. His men were about to rebel against him. Didn't want to follow him anymore because he made a mistake and now they had lost everything. David was discouraged. David was about ready to give up hope. And it says he inquired of the Lord. How many of you know when things look bad, when you're in that moment of darkness, it's good to pray out and inquire of the Lord? Turn over there to 1 Samuel chapter 30 because I want you to see this. Because this is what we have to do for us to recover what the devil has stolen. 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 8. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, 
Shall I pursue? Everybody say pursue. Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake? Everybody say overtake. Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered and said, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail you will recover all. Everybody say recover all. There's about to be a great release of what's been stolen and what's been lost in this year 2010. But we have got to inquire of the Lord to get the direction God wants for us. And it's going to involve us pursuing, overtaking, and then recovering all. I don't know what you've lost. You may have lost your joy. You may have lost your peace. You may have lost your hope. I'm telling you, this is a year that it's going to be released back into you in floods. The flood of the Spirit of God is going to move into your life. You've just got to pursue it. Inquire the Lord. How do you want me to pursue it, Lord? Where do I need to go? You begin to pursue it, and you overcome it. You see, we cannot stand by and passively just wait for God to do something and let the devil continue to beat up on us. We've got to engage the enemy. We've got to go on the offensive. And we've got to take back what the devil stole and make him pay it back sevenfold. I'm telling you, this is the year of release. And God is going to release and help get back everything the devil's stolen in sevenfold fashion. I'm telling you, get ready. This is the year of release. God's going to bring back that which has been lost, that which has been stolen. We're going to go after it. Everybody say, pursue, overtake, and recover it all. How many of you got some things the enemy's stolen from you? It's about time to get it back. Yeah. I'm t I mean, that's a lot of hands. That just makes me mad. He has no business meddling with our business. It's time for us to rise up and resist the devil and make him flee. Get him out of your life. Get him out of your family's life. God's giving you dominion and authority. Rise up in the power of God. Use the name of Jesus. Use the word. Use the blood. It is written. It is written. I'm telling you, get him out of your life and get back everything he's stolen. This is a year of release. It's a time to recover it all. We're going to get back what the devil's stolen. Amen? Amen? Second major area of release that I see happening this year is a release of incredible victories and triumphs. The Bible says he always causes us to triumph. He says we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. T turn over to 1 John chapter 4. Everybody say victories. Everybody say victories are coming my way. 1 John chapter 4. This is our year of release. I'm telling you, we win in 2010. 1 John chapter 5, excuse me, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For whatever is born of God. Now, how many of you are born of God? It means born again, believe in Jesus. That means you're a whatever. You that are watching. If you have Jesus in your heart, you're a whatever. If you don't, this is a great time to receive the Lord. Call upon his name and he shall save you. We'll pray for you here at the end of the service as well. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. If you're born again, you're born to be a winner. There are no losers You've got to get a picture of who you are in Christ. You've been born to win, not born to lose. If Jesus is inside of you, you've been ordained to walk in victory, to be more than a conqueror. That's what, what belongs to us as believers in Christ. That's what Jesus died on the cross. He said that I, might, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Losing is not an abundant life. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to seek that which is lost. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. We're to live a life of victory. Yet so many times we encounter opposition and difficulties that cause us to step back. I'm telling you, it's time 
to step into the victories that God has given us. I'm t- no more defeats. No more retreats. Nothing but advancement, moving forward. The violent shall take it by force. I'm telling you, it's time for us to move forward as the body of Christ. 2010 is a year of release, a year that we win. There's going to be a release of getting back what's been lost and stolen. There's going to be a release of victories. Whoever's been born of God overcomes the world. This is our victory, even our faith. Okay, how do we win? We can shout, get excited. We win in 2010. We're destined to win in 2010. Well, there are some things we've got to do to ensure we win. I'm going to give you three just real quick things that we need to do in order to win strategies, disciplines that we need to have in place in order to, one, is you got to be ready. Everybody say, be ready. Turn to the person next to him, ask him, are you ready? If you're going to win, if you're going to have victory in your life, you've got to be ready. You can't just show up on game day and expect to win if you haven't been practicing and you're not ready. We're in bowl season, all kinds of bowls going on. Nebraska won their bowl. <laughs> Oklahoma won their bowl game. I don't know, did OSU win? Negative. They weren't ready. <laughs> If you're going to win, you got to be. And I'll bet you Coach Gundy would be the first one. We just weren't ready. Didn't do a good job of coaching. We didn't do a good job of getting the team ready. We just weren't ready. I'm t- if you want to win, you've got to be ready. You've got to be prepared. For us as Christians in the life that we live, in order to have the victory, to walk out that victory, in order for us to be ready, there's a couple of things that we have to do. The Bible says we need to be Alert, on guard, be ready. The apostle Paul, Peter, James, all in their books talked about being alert, on guard, being ready. If we're to win, you've got to be on guard. The, the, the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom who he can devour. He says we're to be aware of his devices. See, if you're not aware of him prowling around and aware of his devices, what happens is you end up being deceived and you end up having your life torn apart and things stolen from you. You end up retreating and end up in defeat. I'm talking about advancing and moving forward. We cannot allow the enemy to deceive us. I mean, how many of you ever go fishing? A few of you go fishing. Okay, if you, if you go fishing, the idea is to what? Catch fish. And if you catch, to catch fish, you've got to have some sort of bait, right? You, you put it on a hook, a, a worm or a minnow, or you, you, you get a, some kind of a shiny lure, put it on the end of your, your fishing rod, and, and, you, and you throw that lure or that bait out into the lake or wherever you're fishing, and, and then all you great fishermen know exactly how to, you know, make that bait look good. You know, just roll it in slow or up and down just to make it look real attractive to the fish. And, and if you're a really good fisherman, when that fish sees that worm or sees that lure and he goes for it and he bites it, the moment he bites it, what do you do? You set the hook. Well, the enemy's out there throwing bait our way, lures, trying to deceive us to get us to go for his bait. And to hook us. We've got to be on guard. We've got to be alert. We've got to know the devices of the enemy. I'm telling you, if you're going to win, you've got to be ready and understand what the enemy is going to come at you. Getting ready for these football games. All of the defenses were studying the offenses. Every play that they would run. And, and so they would be prepared for no matter what type of play they would run, they'd have an answer for it. I'm telling you, we've got to be prepared and ready for whatever comes our way so that we can elude the enemy and go for the touchdown. I'm telling you, it's time to score big time. Yeah, it's time for great victories. If we're going to win, we've got to be ready. We've got to be alert. That means we've got to be in the Word. 
This is the beginning of a new year. I want to encourage you. Make a fresh commitment to be in the Word. Reading God's Word. We have a Bible reading plan that will take you through the Bible in a year. They're out on the kiosk. We mail them out. And this is a great plan that will take you through the Bible. You don't have to go through this. You can use any plan that, that you want. Just something that will help discipline you to read through the Bible. If you're going to win, you've got to get fed on with God's Word. You've got to continually look at that Word and meditate on that Word. Joshua 1.8 says to meditate on it day and night. And then when we do, our ways will be prosperous and successful. We will have victory. What's the key to winning? Be alert, be on guard, be in his word, make a commitment beginning of the year that this year I'm going to be a word person. I'm going to study the word. I'm going to read the word. Second, thirdly, you need to be in prayer. If you're going to win. How many want to win? If you're going to be ready, <laughs> you got to be alert. you got to be in the word. You need to be praying. Now, praying is simply talking to God. This is the beginning of the new year. This is a great time to make a fresh commitment Check up. Where am I in my time with the Lord? Am I reading the word on a regular basis? Am I in prayer? Am I in communion with, with the Father? Am I talking with him? That's all that prayer is about. Prayers, sometimes we make prayer too difficult. Prayer is just, Lord, you know, what, what, what should I do here? God, I'm facing this situation. What should I do? Listen to what he says. Well, you need to go do this. You need to do that. Okay, I got you. Well, you know, he may be talking to you about, you know, correcting some things in your life, doing some things differently, just being in fellowship with him. I'm talking about being in a position to win, to have incredible victories in your life. You can't just sit back and twiddle your thumbs and think the victory is just going to happen. Jesus has already won the victory, but we've got to walk it out. We've got to enforce that victory. We're an occupying army, and that requires us to continually engage the enemy. Too many of us sit back waiting on the enemy to come our way. I'm telling you, it's time for us to advance, to be alert, to be on guard, have the Word of God in our hearts so when temptation comes, situations come, we have the Word of God just like Jesus did. It's written, we not, shall not live by bread alone. It's written. We're in communion with the Father. He's given us directions from headquarters, orders from headquarters. As we pray with him, he's talking to us. We're talking to him. We're in contact with him, that we're linked up with him. Then we've got to be in church. If we're going to be ready and enjoy great victories, we've got to be committed to being in church. Hebrews says, that we should not forsake the gathering together as a church. See, there's incredible strength found in corporate worship. When we come together as the body of Christ, there's a great exchange that happens. There's a synergy that happens. In this atmosphere of corporate worship and receiving the word and fellowshipping with one another, we receive an empowerment from the Spirit of God. We, we're able to encourage others. They're able to encourage us. It brings strength to us. And as we come into this new year, I want to encourage you. Be committed to be in church. We have church on Sundays, Saturday nights, Sundays, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, midweek service. And what I find is people tend to begin to drift. And those that used to be in church on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, all of a sudden they're not here on Sunday night anymore and then not on Wednesday night and you see them Sunday mornings and then the Sunday mornings are maybe three out of the four Sundays and, and, it, and it's just a gradual thing that happens and what happens is you become a bigger target for the enemy and don't think that you'll be able to experience the victories and the triumphs that, you, that God wants you to experience if that's the state that you're in now let me make this clear Reading the Bible, praying, and coming to church does not guarantee victory. I, I see too many people make it a religious habit. I'm not talking about doing something out of a religious have-to law. That won't do you any good. We do it because 
we understand the importance of it. It's an outflow of us. That, that we, we're communion with the... You know, I spend time with my wife not because I have to, but because I want to. We spend time with the Lord not because we have to. Well, Pastor Bruce said we better this year or we're not going to have victory. No, no. No, because we want to spend time with the Lord. And out of that relationship, we get direction and encouragement and correction in our life. Don't, don't come to church just because I stand up here and say you, you come to church and if you don't come to church, you're going to hell. That's not, that's not the case. Going to church doesn't save you. But I can guarantee you, if you're not in church, you're not going to have victory. Coming to practice doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be on the football team. But if you want to be on the football team, you better be at practice. And so what I'm sharing with you is just some practical things. This is the year of release. I believe it with all my heart. I believe what's been held back, things that have been held back, are about to be released for those that are ready, for those who will believe. There's going to be a release of getting back what the devil's stolen. If we will pursue it, inquire of the Lord, pursue it, overtake it, and we'll recover it all. I'm telling you, things that you've lost, they're coming back. There are incredible victories lying ahead for every person in this room. As us as a church, as the body, we're in place for incredible victories. You see, people would look and, and say, well, you, you lost your pastor. How, how are you going to make it? Listen, first of all, I don't look at it as, as, as losing our pastor. I look at it as we've sown our pastor. <laughs> it's a seed that brings forth a harvest. You see, you, you've got to change your perspective. He's in heaven. And he's a seed in heaven that is bringing forth tremendous harvest here as we multiply out and do what God's called us to do. Get ready, get ready, get ready for victories. Incredible victories coming your way, triumphs coming your way. But we've got to be ready. We've got to be on guard. We've got to be alert. Keep the word in our heart fresh. Stay in communion with the Lord. Stay in church. And we've got to stay filled with the Spirit. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dis dissipation, but be filled. Everybody say, but be filled. Everybody say, but be filled. Everybody say, but be filled. But be filled with the Spirit. Listen. We need the power of the Holy Ghost operating in our life. And Paul says here that we need to continually be filled with the Spirit. So the baptism with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a one-time experience. It's not something we experience and check off and say, I got it. It's something that on an ongoing basis that we need to be filled. If you're going to have victory in your life, you need the power of the Spirit of God moving in your life. And I want to encourage you tonight to be filled with His Spirit, new and afresh, that out of you would flow rivers of living water, fresh fire from heaven, a fresh anointing on a daily basis that we're giving out of the overflow, not a half full but overflow. There is a infilling of the Spirit of God. He wants to fill you new and afresh with His Spirit that out of you would flow rivers of living water. If we're going to re receive the victories that God wants us to have, we've got to be ready and we've got to be in a place of faith. Everybody say faith. Victories come with a spirit of faith. I call it the God factor. You see, the moment you apply the God factor, everything becomes possible. The Bible says nothing is impossible with God, and nothing is impossible with him that believes. In other words, there's always a but God. I was lost, but God found me. I was hurting, but God healed me. How do three Hebrew children get delivered out of a fiery furnace? The God factor but God delivered them out of that fire. How does the lion's mouth get shut 
in the den when Daniel's thrown in. It's the God factor. If you want to see victory, you've got to release your faith and allow God to move in your life. Give God room to operate in that circumstance or that situation. Yeah, it may look impossible. It may look uh, difficult. It may look uh, like there's no way that you can get through the situation. But if you let God in the midst of the situation, it's possible. Everybody say the God factor. Everybody say victories are coming my way. Say release of victories are coming my way. Believe God for the impossible. Do not quit. And the third area of great release this year is for harvest. Turn to John chapter 4. Everybody say harvest. John chapter 4, Jesus gives this word to his disciples. John chapter 4, verse 35, he says, Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready, already white for harvest. This is going to be a year of incredible harvest coming your way. A harvest of souls, a harvest of finance. I'm telling you, harvest like you've never seen before. I grew up in Nebraska farming the land up there. And when, growing up, if we got 120 or 130 bushel an acre uh, of corn, uh, that, was, that was doing great. And then all of a sudden, things began began to improve in the farming practices and fertilizing. And all of a sudden, the, the yields started going to 150 bushel an acre, 175 bushel an acre. I was talking to my brother-in-law who still farms up there, farms 3,000 acres. Over the 3,000 acres, he averaged over 200 bushel an acre. Incredible harvest. But that is nothing compared to about what's going to happen in the earth today. I'm telling you, prodigals are coming home. Those of you have been believing for harvest across the nations of the world. I'm telling you, get ready for harvest. Harvest of finances, seeds that you've sown for financial breakthrough. I'm telling you, they've been held back, but they're about to be released, and you're going to see a multiplication of provision and abundance coming your way. This generation, they say this generation is lost. This generation there is is going the wrong direction. I'm telling you, this generation is going to arise in this hour. They're going to shine. It's harvest time in the earth. Pastor Billy Joe preached it. He declared, we're going after this generation. I want you to watch Pastor's word on the harvest for this generation. I see a generation rising, rising up to take their place. And I'm telling you, I see it. I see in this group, those of you that stood, Hundreds of others in the 9 o'clock service. And last night, hundreds of people in that generation that are fed up with hypocrisy, that are fed up with the plasticness of other people. And they're saying, I'm going to be the real thing. And the greatest thing you can do is not attack and criticize others. It's be what you want other people to be for you. It's time to prophesy to this generation. To declare the word of the Lord with authority. There is an army that's rising up. It's about to come out in every direction. Unstoppable. People cannot. It's going to be in the face of the world. In, can y'all shout to the Lord? Every realm. You say, where is it going to happen? I'm saying it's going to happen in the music world, the entertainment world, the business world. Every industry, there are people that are saying, we're going to stand up for justice and truth, righteousness and holiness. The last of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, 5, and 6, God said he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. That includes the mothers, the, the seniors, the elders who can mentor, who can nurture. And this is my prayer for all of you. If you've had no desire toward the next generation, I'm praying you would begin to have it. God's going to use you to touch the next generation. It's not limited to a church building. It's not limited to being behind a pulpit or on the mission field. It's wherever you are. And all of us have some type of contact, either in the neighborhood, at work, through friends who have children and teens, where we can find the place of connection. You see, there is a Joshua generation that's rising. A generation that says, we're going to take the land. There may have been a group that didn't want to go in. But the Joshua generation is the generation right now. They have an attitude, they can do anything. They know anything, they could just ask them. I'm telling you, they've got it. Is that true? 
It's an audacious generation. It's a generation that is ready to take on any challenge. Adventure, excitement, and the greatest adventure, the greatest excitement there is, is taking on the powers of darkness and driving them backward and rescuing the perishing. And this is the hour. They're awakening to that very thing. When Sharon and I were in our teens in the 60s, our nation had been hit with the spirit related to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, spirit of godlessness, sexual immorality, drugs, and anarchy. And it swept our country. It was an invasion. And we watched it all around. It looked like there was no hope. But you know, in the middle of that, the greatest youth revival that's ever hit America happened in the Jesus movement. And hundreds of thousands of young people were swept into the kingdom of God. God's going to do it again. This is the hour. This is the time. We're a part of it, like Ezekiel. When I transferred from State University here to Oral Roberts University, I only had one person that I knew. So I didn't have a lot of things to, to do, and I uh, didn't have a car on campus. So I heard about this what they call the Pentecostal Library. Today, it's the Holy Spirit Research Center. And it's a section in the ORU library where they had tapes of speakers and books of people all through the whole charismatic Pentecostal movement. Well, one of the popular people that I had heard of and seen, I saw the movie, The Cross and Switchblade, the, was the story of David Wilkerson. So I wanted to hear one of his messages, and back then it was the reel-to-reel tapes. And so I checked it out, and I'm after class sometime about four in the afternoon. I'm just sitting there in this little desk-type carol thing and playing this tape, and he's preaching in a youth conference, several thousand teenagers there. And he began to prophesy. He said, in the last days... There's going to be a generation of young people that will rise up and they will take their place and they will sweep across the earth and the end time harvest will be reached. Everything that had been happening in me, I I didn't understand fully, but it was at that moment it all came together and it collided. I burst into tears. I fell out of my seat. It was like I was knocked out right on the carpet there and just laying on the floor, sobbing. And this is what came out of my mouth. God, I'm going to be one of those people. That decision changed my life forever. There are people in this room that you say, I'm going to be a part of this last generation in time harvest. I want to pray over you. If that's you, Jump to your feet and come and stand with me right here. Everybody just bow your head for a moment. And if that's in your heart to go after this end time generation, to go after this harvest, I want to pray for you. I'm going to open up the altar in just a moment.